Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Conducting Depositions Online, What You Need to Know. Today's webinar is brought to you by Legal Fuel, the Practice Resource Center of the Florida Bar and Esquire Deposition Solutions. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. We'll be recording this webinar and we'll share the link after the event. The recording and any supporting resources will also be posted to our website, legalfuel.com. Any questions you may have during today's presentation can be asked through the Q&A feature. You'll find the Q&A down at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom control panel. Our presenters will do their best to answer any questions. However, due to time constraints, they may not be able to address them all. Today's presentation has been approved by the Florida Bar for one hour of general CLE credit and one hour of technology. The course number for today is 4076. I would now like to introduce today's presenters. Hallie Peters is a licensed Florida attorney with almost 10 years of experience, including litigating nationwide class actions and representing financial institutions against customer claims and in securities matters. At Esquire, Hallie provides over 300 law firms and corporations with the legal technology and expertise to efficiently and effectively manage the discovery and deposition process. She currently serves as a committee chair on the technology committee of the Florida Bar and was elected vice president of the Junior League of Miami. Hallie graduated magna cum laude from the University of Miami School of Law and earned her undergraduate degrees from the University of Michigan. Karen Cespedes is a complex litigation consultant for Esquire Deposition Solutions. With more than 14 years in the legal industry, Ms. Cespedes, a former State Department fellow, has significant experience establishing strategic corporate partnerships, implementing consultative litigation strategies, and collaborating with legal professionals, law firms, and Fortune 500 companies. She is responsible for guiding corporations, law firms, attorneys, and their teams to effectively manage the deposition and discovery process. Karen sits on the CABA Pro Bono Board of Directors and serves as its secretary, as well as the Florida Bar's Citizens Advisory Committee and the Florida Bar's 11th Circuit Grievance Committee. Karen is a World's Ahead graduate from the Florida International University, and she graduated with a Master's in International Relations and East Asian Studies. Enjoy the presentation and I'll hand it off to Karen and Hallie. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and thank you so much to Legal Fuel, the Practice Resource Center, for having us today. Uh, thank you all for joining us as well. Um, we are here today to really discuss something that is in everyone on everyone's mind is how are we proceeding in this new abnormal that is definitely here to stay. So the reason why we're here is we'd like to give you an opportunity to understand the whys behind remote technology, why it's important, how and how we're going to litigate remotely, and enable you to think with, enable you with some things that you may have thought of or maybe not. And um, we'd like to arm you with the information to intelligently discuss remote technology with opposing counsel, your clients, your legal teams, and the court system, and explain why we need this and the practicalities of the world that we live in now. We're going to talk about what litigating looks like and also address the Florida Supreme Court's most recent administrative orders and the continuity work group that they have established. So this is, we are in unprecedented times. I think um, even net nationwide, Miami and Florida in general has been severely hit um, by the coronavirus. And we are calling it the new abnormal, but we know now that it's here to stay. Um, of course, local, state, and federal guidelines or orders have restricted commercial activity, um, even requiring a lot of people to work from home. I'm sure perhaps your firm has done the same. Um, Florida is particularly affected by the spikes, of course, and many of us are feeling the effects. Uh, things like even the, the bar exam has been rescheduled to accommodate COVID. Um, will that get pushed? Will it not? Of course, social distancing is now a norm. and a lot of us are required to use remote technology, even if prior to COVID, we may not have been a big fan. So what's at stake? Every state and all courts have issued some type of order addressing coronavirus in the situation, extending deadlines, talking about different ways to handle depositions and conduct hearings. And one thing that every single order has talked about is the concern about court backlogs, which are already bad. Court backlogs are going to be exacerbated further um, with the first cases, if and when the courts open back up, with the first cases being criminal to be heard first. Where does that leave us civil litigators? So in addition to the exacerbated court logs, what's at stake is protecting your client's cases. Your, your duty to zealously represent your clients, how do you do that? Obviously, stay, 
stalling the case indefinitely does not accomplish this. And what about your law firm and attorney business continuity? Maintaining a revenue stream, the cybersecurity issues that you now face working from home, concerns with remote hearings, especially evidentiary, how are you going to present uh, exhibits? How, how are you going to have your witness if they lack the necessary technology to effectively participate? Of course, the, another thing at stake, essential cases that must be heard, due process and emergency issues. And last but certainly not least, the health and safety of all members of the court system. So next slide, please. For a litigator, of course, sitting on the sideline is not an option. Um, as with Esquire, we've seen a lot of our clients maybe try to push depositions towards the future. Well, in, from March, they pushed them to, to, to July. Well, it's July now, and now it's really becoming evident that you, we cannot continue to delay. Uh, courts have also recognized this, and they're encouraging the use of video conferencing and the use of remote technology in every regard. And what I'll say some good news, <laughs> not focusing on all of the negative changes, but some next slides, please. Uh, some good news is that there is a lot of new litigation trends. Uh, we are seeing the number of corona related litigation uh, increase, business interruption, you have insurance claims. Voters' rights, which of course will become especially important in the coming months. Cures and preventions. There are a number of cases, for example, pending right now against Purell and different uh, hand sanitizer companies and even face mask companies for how, how effective their measures were and do they actually do what they say that they are doing. Price gouging and failure to refund. I think failure to refund is one especially important as we approach the university season and school season. Um, of course, airlines, concerts and festivals, and even just private schools. And also suits regarding governmental action or emergency matters. Uh, the right to use, we see this in Michigan, Florida, um, a lot of the beaches, whether they close in a sufficient time to really protect everyone here in Florida with all of our beaches. And then the client company needs. We're seeing so many bankruptcy and restructuring cases. We always see these during a recession, but just to highlight a few that most recently um, have filed for bankruptcy, J. Crew, Neiman Marcus, J.C. Penney, Book Brooks Brothers, GNC, these are just some of the larger companies that are filing for bankruptcy. Think about how many bankruptcies are being filed by the smaller businesses. Of course, there are employment claims, people being furloughed, um, fired during this time. Unemployment his claims have now risen higher than ever before. And again, back to cybersecurity. How are you protecting your client's information? Is it secure? Are you, is, does your service with your firm, is everything encrypted when you are transmitting data and communicating with your office remotely? Um, healthcare, of course, crisis management and supply chains. We are going to see an uptick in litigation and we already are with exacerbated court backlogs. So as litigators now, what are we going to do now to get our system, to get our cases moving through this system that is very unfamiliar to everyone. And next slide, please. Um, well, to keep your cases moving, we do have some good tips. I do re recommend re uh, checking out the article that is referenced at the bottom. It's a New York Law Journal article with some great tips. So balancing reasonable accommodations with moving your, case, your client's cases forward. It's of course, we're going to lead with empathy and respect and professionalism, making sure that your clients are aware you're doing your best to zealously represent them during this time. Of course, agreeing to reasonable adjournments with opposing counsel, and, but keeping those deadlines on a short leash. Uh, proposing doing depositions and court conferences by video, that's become very much a norm. And then also pushing back on litigants who seek delay for strategic gain. This one is particularly important. Um, you would like to require opposing counsel to explain why they're delaying and get their excuse in writing. Don't be afraid though to take this issue to a judge and file a motion to get uh, asking the judge for guidance on what to do when opposing counsel is um, being particularly difficult or not wanting to move the case forward. Um, of course, this plays on both edges of the sword. We're seeing a lot of litigants using this time to their advantage, uh, not always with the best intentions in mind. And then last but not least, and I will highlight this, do not let, the, do not let perfect be the enemy of good. So I'll say it again, do not let perfect be the enemy of good. What does this mean? Of course, ideally we would like to be in person. We would like to be deposing uh, witnesses in person. We want to be in court. That's why we're litigators. Unfortunately, during this time, that is not often a possibility. So video conference is what we have and it's good. It's not the best, 
but it's what we have. And the more and more that you practice and the more and more you get used to it, the easier and more normal it will become. So we've discussed the practicalities and why we're here. Now let's talk about the laws and rules governing remote proceedings here from the federal level to the Florida level and the impact of the court's emergency orders. So state's rules have really moved to remote and COVID was a catalyst to this. Every single state has issued an order um, and all of these orders do the same, a lot of the same things, encouraging parties to use remote technology. And every single state is encouraging the use of video conferencing and relaxing any of the procedural or civil procedure rules that prohibit or restrict the use of remote technology. As an example of that, a number of states, including Florida, adopted such orders, again, with the same goals, ensuring the health and safety of litigants, judges, and the court system, and proceeding when possible using the remote means. And last, and again, certainly not least, leading with professionalism and empathy. Grace and empathy is at, uh, as at utmost importance today and as you proceed in this new remote world. So as I mentioned, many states have changed their rules or they're very similar to the federal rules, which do provide for the remote swearing in of a witness. A handful are not, and Florida was one of them. You'll see the list of the different states that, like Florida, did have to allow and specifically provide for the remote swearing in of a witness. And as a result of COVID, all the related orders and, and remote or remote oaths and remote court reporting is permitted in nearly in every single state. So I'll say that again, as a result of COVID-19, every single state now provides for the remote swearing in of witnesses and the remote uh, taking of the oath. So let's focus on Florida. The Florida rules, rules of civil procedure, as I mentioned, did not allow for the remote swearing in of a witness. As you'll see, Rule 1.300C, you can stipulate to the by which stipulate to the means by which that you swear in the witness. And also 1.310C does specifically limit though that you must take the take the oath in person. So that was the big hurdle. As we moved forward with COVID, well, going back, the Florida Attorney General did interpret this. When he did interpret the rule, he noticed it was almost as if they were going to provide for the remote swearing in of a witness, and, but that changed. Florida Supreme Court specifically wiped out the requirement and they further clarified that video conferencing and audio technology could be used to administer the oath remotely. This COVID pandemic though has definitely paved the way for courts to adopt and embrace this important change to reflect the new abnormal. And we are seeing that now as we fast forward to, next slide please, March 16th. So now that we, ha we have the rule that limits us, a lot of, I will say a lot of different Florida attorneys, a lot of different Florida bar committees have always been pushing for the remote swearing in of a witness to be able to have a deposition remotely. Um, unfortunately, they could not agree until COVID. And then with COVID, I will say, I'm, I'm proud to say that Esquire did um, provide some of the language that was eventually adopted by Justice Kennedy in the orders permitting the remote swearing in. So on March 16th, 2020, as a result, again, of COVID, um, the attorneys got together, the different committees, and we did propose language and requested an emergency order permitting remote oaths. And next slide, please. Two days later, on March 18th, the Florida Supreme Court and Justice Kennedy issued Administrative Order 2016. This administrative order effectively allows for the swearing in of a witness remotely by audio video communication technology from a location in the state of Florida. For purposes of the provision regarding the administering of OSO, the term positively identify, which is key language here, means that the notary or other qualified person can both see and hear the witness or new attorney via audio and video communications. So what does this mean? This means you cannot swear in a witness using the telephone. A lot of our clients sometimes ask that. No, actually the witness and how it works in practice is that the witness will actually have their ID, show it to the court reporter, hold it up right to the video. And with that, the court reporter is able to identify the witness and know where their location is. I will, as a word of caution, if you are noticing a deposition, it's it, especially, especially important now to know where the witness will be at the time of the deposition. Why? Well, if your witness is in North Carolina or not in Miami and you 
you expected your witness to be in Miami. Well, at that moment, we're, we're going to need to find a court reporter in North Carolina or whatever location the witness may be to ensure that the, that the oath is administered properly and that the witness is properly sworn in. What else has the Florida Supreme Court done? Well, the Florida Supreme Court, I will, I'm especially proud of them. They have definitely worked on this and they're looking ahead. Uh, Justice Kennedy recently established a continuity work group, a task force of 17, now 18, different members of our court system. Many of them are judges. Um, most recently added was a sheriff. And this continuity work group was given a list of different tasks that Justice Kennedy and the Florida Supreme Court had asked them to research. And with the different recommendations, a lot has happened in Florida. So some of the major next steps that Justice Kennedy proposes for the continuity work group, um, which was established on April 21st, is to propose guidance. How, do we, how are we going to get back into courts? Are we going to be in person? How does this look? And also recommend the priority in which the proceedings that require in-person hearings and trials should resume. I won't read through all of those, but I do recommend that you look at the Florida Supreme Court uh, website, as well as the Legal Fuel website, which um, can help direct you as these different orders continue to come up. So one specific um, one I'll draw your, your attention to is that acting on the recommendations of the statewide court continuity work group on COVID, uh, Florida's Chief Justice Charles Kennedy, he issued a new emergency order adopting a lot of those recommendations. So April 21st, the continuity work group was established. They got to work immediately. By May 4th, there was an order um, issued allowing for a number of additional proceedings to be conducted remotely. So what does this mean? I'll draw your attention to a few. And again, please do bookmark and look up the Florida Supreme Court uh, website so you can be con constantly updated on these. But for remote proceedings, non-jury trials will be remote. Status, case management, and pretrial conferences in all case types. And then I think one of the most important ones that I definitely have seen my clients having issues with are the evidentiary motion hearings in all case types. Thinking that about that, how are you going to present your exhibits remotely? How are you going to get your witnesses there? Um, I know one court, in particular Broward County Courts, they do have space set up for the different witnesses to come in. They can use the technology there. They're able to participate and it is socially distanced and very set apart. So that is one of the ways the courts are really handling this and ensuring that everyone has access to justice. So that's one. And then also more recently, the continuity work group also recommended pilot programs for remote jury trials. Five trial courts were chosen to conduct tests of the remote technology for remote jury trials and also jury trials that actually are happening in person. I mean, I know Judge Butch Co recently has been really adamant and moving forward with having um, jury trials in person. I recommend looking that up, Judge Butch Co's uh, YouTube very interesting to see how it's working. But the five trial court circuits that were selected as a, during this pilot program are Jacksonville, Daytona, Daytona Beach, Orlando, Miami, Paul Beach. So those are the main pilot programs. Some of them are not moving forward due to COVID, which next slide, I'll say that that's one of probably the negatives of what's been happening because of the spikes. But again, back to Justice Kennedy and all the work that the continuity work group has been doing. Florida is looking ahead, but they're looking ahead cautiously, which is a good thing. Um, there are four phases that the court has outlined for the reopening of the different court systems. Um, most of the courts, unfortunately, now are at phase one or phase two, with phase two um, basically a lot, still requiring masks. Um, and once you hit a phase, you're then able to, after a certain amount of time, move on to the next phase. It's slow going. And as I mentioned, phase two is just when the limited in-person contact is authorized for certain purposes in state courts, you may require protective measures. And it goes on and on to phase four, which of course is when COVID-19 is no longer present and it's not a significant risk to public health. So we are all hoping we get there soon. But as we move forward, one of the blanket requirements that the Supreme Court has strictly stated is that masks, they are required. They're required in all public areas of the courthouse, as well as health screenings and temperature checks at the security checkpoints of the courthouse. So if you are one of the litigators that is heading to court, perhaps consider this hazmat suit, like one attorney in Miami did recently. Um, that attorney was 
going to a sentencing of his client in criminal court. And he felt it was necessary to do this in person. And this is how he chose to address it. Be as careful, but just know that there are benchmarks that you must abide by if you're going to court. So, and also the current, like looking at the current landscape under these different regulations and requirements, criminal and civil trials, of course, as we know as litigators have been suspended in Florida since early March. Um, of course, we are trying the pilot programs of remote jury trials. Um, it's going well, where the court's also determining which type of platform to use, whether it's Zoom, WebEx, Microsoft Teams, they are exploring different options. This does bring with it some uh, opposition. Some attorneys just do not feel that this is acceptable to have remote juries. They view it as a very bad idea, a violation of due process, and that every case would be appealable. Regardless of what side of the coin you, you fall on, this is a requirement and different bar associations have said, okay, the attorneys will have to accept this. This is how we have to proceed. We don't know when this is going to end. So at this moment, it's not a winning argument to say we're not going to proceed because of these concerns or the due process concerns. It is very clear that courts are going to move forward using the remote technology as much as possible. So the court appearances, again, that has been a bit difficult. Palm Beach County has definitely had to cut back at, with the spikes. So again, looking ahead cautiously, what has gone right? Focus on the positive. The continuity work group, the hard work that they're doing. Um, a lot of the judges on the work group have stated, you know, my, my normal job has really taken the back burner because this is my full-time job. It is that important and it is that important for us and our clients. Um, also, the court's ability to modify requirements. The different circuits do have the capability and, ability, and they have been like, looking at the landscape in their particular circuits and addressing the needs of their circuits um, as best as they can. And also, I've heard from a lot of clients the ability to move cases along faster. So now you don't have to worry if a witness is in wherever he or she may be. The witness can participate remotely and oftentimes that will speed up the case. So where are improvements still needed? Circling back to just the beginning of this presentation, the court backlog. The court backlog is just, it's a very, very pressing issue. Of course, if and when we do go back to in-person court proceedings, the criminal cases will definitely be preferred and go first over the civil cases and addressing that and making sure that we as litigants know that we need to be cognizant of that and advise our clients as well. Also Zoom bombing, that has happened, um, as Karen will get into, make sure that any agency that you are working with using a Zoom platform or WebEx or otherwise, password protected, extremely secure, and make sure that Zoom bombing is not even an option. And then also with the pilot programs, unfortunately, as I mentioned, some of them are not able to move forward because of the recent spikes, especially in Florida. Um, so being abreast of everything that's going on in your circuit and statewide, again, I'll refer you to the Legal Fuel website, the, and also the Florida Bar's um, administrative order and news updates. So how does this work in practice? Under these different orders, and I will include this um, when we email out to all the attendees, so don't worry. Um, this has been a popular subject. The sample notice and the sample stipulation. So the sample notice languages for noticing a remote deposition, remote hearing. Um, the language there, we always recommend to reference the most recent administrative order issued by the Florida Supreme Court. So you can always refer back to it. And then the sample stipulation, stipulating with opposing counsel that this deposition is going to go forward remotely. Of course, make sure also that your court reporter has received training on how to administer this oath because it is different. Um, again, we will include this sample language uh, with uh, the slides when we send it out to everyone that's att in attendance today. And I will say though, that remote depositions are not new. Another piece of good advice. Um, remote depositions have been conducted well before COVID. Um, of course, all the benefits that you see with using technology to making remote depositions very easy and convenient. Um, now you're able to have a deposition with an expert witness in Nevada and a client in London, um, all within the same day. You don't have to drive to Pensacola every, every time for, by using remote deposition technology. Also has reduced travel. And the remote participation by the client, legal teams, and associates, paralegals, whomever might be necessary and helpful to ensure that the deposition 
goes smoothly and you get the most information that you need for the case in one deposition. And last but not least, electronic exhibits, saving money, not having to print them, not having to carry all of a huge stack of papers. And now with remote depositions not being new, um, it has been a very important piece of ensuring that they're going smoothly now. Uh, as Karen will also get into an agency with a lot of experience with remote depositions prior to COVID definitely is a huge and important piece to look at with whomever you are working with. But I will caution, it takes more than a webcam and an internet connection to safely and securely conduct a deposition and, and capture the record. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Karen, who will explain to, how to ensure that the record is captured accurately. Karen? Thank you so much, Hallie. So I'll spend the remainder of the webinar discussing remote depositions, what they are, and what happens before, during, and after. I will review the different stages of PrEP and break down what you and the core reporting agency need to do in order to ensure a smooth proceeding. So let's begin by defining the difference between remote deposition and remote court reporting services. Right. So first, there is remote deposition service in which one or more attendees can be remote, but the court reporter is with the witness. And then there is remote court reporting services, and that is when the reporter is apart from the witness. With, with each, there is the option of adding the following, right? Real-time reporting, which is the live transcription of the deposition by the reporter, remote videographer, who records the proceeding using the video conferencing software, remote interpreter, and finally, the adding the paperless and diskless delivery of the final transcript, exhibits, and videos via a secure online repository. So, what makes remote court reporter services different? Really, it comes down to this. The core reporter is not in the same location as the witness. As you heard earlier from Hallie, in some states, this has been available for years. But with the current pandemic, this service means that now everyone, all of us, are remote. And with that, your procedures to prepare for and the proceeding itself must change. But let's start with the core reporter. What's their role now? So, the, re uh, the remote reporter's role should remain traditional. The primary exception is that you will see the court reporter on your screen rather than across the room and that their role with exhibits has changed. The reporter will continue to still swear in the witness, take the record, perform readbacks as requested, control the proceeding, take ownership of that deposition and receive the exhibit. Though, of course, all exhibits now are electronic. There are some functions, however, that the agency should not place on the remote core reporter shoulders. They should not be responsible for downloading and sharing exhibits during the proceeding. They should not be made responsible for pausing the video conferencing recording for off the record comments and they should not be considered the tech support for technology-based questions. For this, they should be able to hand off those issues for the agency to handle. Because again, these actions will take away from the core reporter and for the core reason you have them there, and that's to take down the record verbatim. So while the role of the core reporter remains somewhat traditional, the way they carry out their role remotely is anything but, because with all parties, including the witness, in a different location, your remote reporter should be trained to work in a different way. So ask these questions. What kind of training they, they receive from their core reporting agency? Do they have a clear idea of their role and responsibility? Who is available to support your core reporter before, during, or after the deposition so that they could focus on the proceeding itself? How long has this agency been doing remote reporting? 
did they just introduce this in, repos in response to COVID-19 or do they have the experience truly? And with all parties in different locations handling confidential documents, are their infrastructure and data handling processes secure? Is their staff trained in document security? Because as you'll see, the court reporter isn't the only one who needs the support and the help to make this successful. So here we are, the deposition. And it's really truly about preparing, preparing, preparing. First and foremost, we gotta make sure that all parties and especially the witness has the correct technology to participate in the remote proceedings. The witness is very important because while attorneys traditionally have the technology, it isn't a sure thing that witnesses do. And in this scenario, a court reporter cannot bring an additional computer or an iPad to the witness. So what is needed? Well, first of all, you need a computing device a Windows computer or Mac or an iPad. You also need a good set of speakers, a good microphone. In short, you gotta really think about this and approach this as if you were preparing to record the deposition for trial. And most critical of all is the internet bandwidth. We recommend that you plug your computer into your router if possible but if not, then you've got to prepare your home office for a wireless deposition. And I'll go into this in more detail shortly. So how do the attorney and the team prepare? Well, first of all, we've got to make sure that all team members and attending parties have the equipment and the bandwidth required. Next, you've got to include the language in the notice disclosing the preceding methodology state that this will be a video conference, that the witness will be sworn in remotely and add any stipulations if necessary. Then you gotta be sure that you have prepared your exhibits beforehand and that you've prepared them to be shared electronically. Make sure you think about and you determine who on the team will share the documents and make sure that they have access to the documents in one easy to access folder on their computer's local drive and not on a network or document management system. This is not the time to start hunting down exhibits and PDFs because also what we've seen is that now more than ever, law firms are truly leveraging their paralegals and their staff and leaving the document handling to them during the deposition. Hallie and I are seeing more and more paralegals sit in on the depots with their role being exclusively to share the docs or the exhibits. So that way the attorney is focused on taking the deposition. But even if you don't have a paralegal or an associate to step in, you can easily introduce and share exhibits you truly just have to prepare beforehand and make sure that you are comfortable using the share features of the video con conferencing platform or that you thought about what sort of platform you're gonna use to introduce exhibits. And a good agency and a good rep can, would help you with that and will make themselves available for training. But first, and also very, very most importantly, is that you gotta use the same equipment that you tested on, right? Last minute switches are as risky as they sound. So if you have tested using a certain laptop from a certain location and it's been successful, make sure that you stick with that. I'm transitioning now over to Hallie, who's gonna uh, speak on witness prep and Dale's strategy. Hallie? Thank you so much, Karen. So this is one of my favorite topics and I think one of the most interesting and important aspects of preparing for the deposition. So this is witness prep. So as Karen mentioned, you're going to confirm and test the witness technology and you're going to do it on the device and on the Wi-Fi connection or internet connection that the witness will be using during the actual deposition or other proceeding. And please do this in advance. Again, a good agency will reach out to the witness 24, 48 hours, however long before 
the actual deposition to ensure that the witness understands the technology and that their bandwidth is sufficient. So, and explain the environment and the dress. This, treat it as if you are going to a court proceeding and you are in front of a judge, a professional attire. Uh, make sure that the background is quiet and safe and secure and nondescript. Um, you can use a virtual background like we have, um, just ensuring that if it, this does go, go before a jury, the, the video deposition, that there's no, nothing in the video frame that's going to sway the jury one way or another. And then again, dress rehearsal using the same technology that will be used in the actual proceeding and also recording the dress rehearsal. It's always a good idea, especially with maybe a witness that you're not sure of how this will go. It's, it's great to have that video and then show the witness as well and show them how this will go in practice. One specific point of that is rehearsing the speaking cadence. So again, in a perfect world deposition, you always advise your witness to pause and then think about the question and then answer. It is vitally important that the witness understands that and practices that in a remote setting. So I've even had clients have the witness have a sticky note that says pause, we'll wait for the question, pause, wait for any objections and have that sticky note right on their device, right on their webcam even. Um, of course, this provides the witness with better timing, they can think about their answer, also allows if you're the one objecting, allows for any objections to happen and for the court reporter to accurately write, uh, record and transcribe what is happening and who is saying what. And also setting expectations, not just with the witness, but any, anyone involved in the deposition. Video conference depositions do generally take longer, um, especially, and especially in South Florida, we see this a lot with interpreters. So advising them, yes, this will take a bit longer, um, please be aware of that and making sure that they know that they can take breaks. So along with witness prep, once the witness is prepped, you are going to explain that this is a process and if you're taking the deposition, um, hopefully you're going to make sure that the witness is positioning himself or herself in a way that you can see their hands, you can see them from the mid body and up um, and communicating that, hey, this is important. Um, if they have the capability to be looking down at a phone or something, uh, we've had one client most recently uh, had a suspicion that the witness was doing something on the phone on the record multiple times. Are you speaking with counsel? Are you speaking with counsel? No, no. Um, are you speaking with anyone? Are you texting anyone? No, no. Well, after the deposition, the attorney subpoenaed the records, the phone records of the witness's cell phone. They were communicating with counsel nearly the entire deposition. So this is huge, but getting that important question and doing it a few times on the record is how you can actually subpoena the records and move forward um, with whatever means you'd like to ensure that this does not happen going forward and that it is addressed. Um, communicating, if it is your witness, communicating with how you're going to speak during the breaks. Uh, we definitely do not recommend using the Zoom platform for that because you're on the deposition. You don't want to accidentally have opposing counsel hear your conversation or anything like that. Um, ensuring that the witness knows how to mute themselves and also turn off their video to make sure that nothing is captured and that opposing counsel does not hear anything. Um, also, going down the line, um, making sure that the witness is going to confirm that no one else is in the room. And this is when you're taking the deposition. Ask the witness, this is so important to get on the record. Is there anyone else in the room with you? Have them show the camera and show, look around the room and have the witness agree on the record that if someone does come into the room, they will number one, announce that person and have them appear on the camera. Uh, that is so important. Uh, so often uh, starting depositions, you ask that and perhaps the person's wife is in the room or their children or their buddy walks up, anything like that. Make sure that it's on the record though, so that you know, the witness knows that they do need to announce this other person. Um, and then also that their witness is going to agree not to communicate with anyone during the deposition. No emailing, no chatting, no texting during the deposition. And again, I just, that story with our client who had to subpoena the records, I think that that really drives at home how important it is that you have the witness agree that they're not going to be communicating. Um, and then also, identifying what technology is in the room. I know some attorneys actually like require that the witness 
remove technologies so that it's not recorded by the witness. For example, if they have Alexa or Siri that's going to go off, those are constantly recording in many, in many smart homes. Um, and that's not something that you would like, that you want to have um, as collateral. And you can have your witness agree not to use those technologies and to turn them off if they do exist. So your witness is prepped. You're feeling good about that. Um, and then your exhibits. This has been a very important point. Karen will get into the nitty gritty, but the exhibit prep, the first decision that you're going to have to make is how you want to present them. Are you, is this a, a favorable witness? Is this something more like a good witness? This is great for authenticating documents as well. If you can email the exhibits prior to the deposition, great, excellent. You can send them to their attorneys, they can distribute them and have them up as the deposition goes forward. But if the element of surprise is important, such as to impeach the witness's credibility, or perhaps you just don't think that the witness will not take the exhibits, run to the attorney and be coached on every single document, you are definitely able to uh, present the exhibits live, whether it's sharing your screen, whether it's uploading the document to a chat feature, most of the platforms do allow and provide for that. Um, and those are live. And then that way the witness will pull it up on their screen. You're able to see everything that everyone that's on the uh, deposition will be able to see exactly what you want to present. And this will be very helpful when the element of surprise is a requirement for you. And with the exhibit marking, we, I will say that there's a number of ways that you can mark, pre-mark the exhibits if you so choose. Of course, a good agency will also offer the opportunity to mark them after the deposition. And again, when exhibits are, when it's important that the witness not see them and the element of surprise is important, uh, marking, post-marking the exhibits is generally what we've been seeing with our clients. But if you are going to mark them, um, I've seen a lot of clients use pre-marking software, there's, it's available Adobe Acrobat Reader. Um, DC is probably the most popular, but I will also say exhibitstickers.com, it is free. And you are able to put the exhibit sticker as if you were putting it on a normal paper exhibit um, and proceed with the exhibits at the deposition that way. So I will now transition to Karen, who's going to talk about additional prep that you're going to do with the parties and the other attorneys to the deposition. Karen? Thank you, Hallie. So you've done your pre-check of your team and your witness. They all have the technology they need and you've decided on who will do the exhibit sharing and marking. So let's talk about the role of the court reporting agency and the prep for the depot. Because mm -hmm. even first, even though you have asked the right questions of the participants you control, the agency should test and validate the hardware and connections of all parties. This test is very, very important, and each test should take no more than five minutes and can be done one party at a time. At this time, they will make sure that the equipment works correctly, right? That the webcam works, that they can hear and uh, they can hear you, and you can also hear them, and they can speak clearly as well. That the bandwidth is good, and that the picture and sound is smooth and clear. At this time, the agency should also confirm optional proceeding services. So did you want real time? Did you want a remote videographer, a remote interpreter? Because while this information maybe was relayed during the initial request, it never hurts to double check to make sure nothing fell through the cracks. Because if you requested an interpreter and if the interpreter doesn't show up, then there's no depot. Now exhibit. Your agency should also discuss with you how you will share your exhibits during the proceedings, right? How are you going to be introducing them at the time of the deposition? Hallie gave various different options in regards to using the share screen feature, the file upload. You can also utilize Fox or other different platforms. Also, they should talk to you about how you want them marked and how you will submit them to the reporter. Make sure really, that you receive the training that you need to ensure smooth proceedings. You need to feel comfortable. You need to test. You need to practice if you haven't used remote technology before. If you haven't shared an exhibit before during a live depot, you need to practice, set up a mock depot, 
with your rep, with the agency, in order to really hone in on these skills. So here we go, the day of the proceeding. You're prepared, and now it's time to move forward with the proceeding itself. But before the proceeding begins, take time for one final check. Enter the virtual room at least 20 minutes ahead of time so that you can make sure that nothing has changed. You want to confirm that the audio is still clear, that your webcam works, and that you can be seen, um, and, and you can see the other participants, that the video stream is still smooth, and that you have a healthy bandwidth. So we recommend a minimum of five megabytes per second. And to find out what your bandwidth actually is on the day of the proceeding, you can go to speedtest.net and it'll provide you with that um, bandwidth. Also, make sure at this time, like how you share, that all unnecessary applications are closed. That will help to free up your computer system resources and then also free up the resources for your bandwidth and your Wi-Fi. And finally, we are here at the all-important environment check. This is something that you don't think about when the deposition is in your office or at our agency or at the agency itself, but at home, it becomes critical. we got to address this a check before we host the proceeding, right? Because now we are taking this deposition not in a professional setting, but truly in our remote uh, location and homes. So one thing is to make sure that there is no unnecessary use of bandwidth, including streaming video services like Netflix or Hulu, that the kids are not online, playing games and eating up bandwidth and that your smart speaker is turned off or down. Also, we want to make sure that you are positioned correctly for the proceeding itself with an uncluttered background, a virtual background if possible, with good lighting to show your face to a court reporter and to the other participants there. Make sure that you are facing the camera that the microphone is near your mouth, and also that you ask others if you can be clearly heard. And also, let's make sure that you are dressed for the deposition itself and not dressed like you're taking this deposition at home. Because remember, we are all still together in the same room virtually, but we are still in the same location. And finally, make sure that you're not disturbed during the depot, right? Let's make sure that your cell phone is off, that any texting applications are set to do not disturb, that the door is closed if possible, and that the background noise is gone. So right now, I have a sign outside that says, mommy's in a presentation. So, you know, hopefully everybody in the house gets, gets the point. <laughs> So for the final check, and right before the, the position begins, you should confirm also that your exhibits are ready. Um, have you prepped your exhibits beforehand, and have they been electronically formatted, and do you know where they are, right? Do you have, have you separated them in a presenter's exhibit folder? So this folder, knowing where your exhibits are, will allow you to easily find them and to share them and open them during the deposition. We also want to confirm that the technology check is completed, that the environment check is completed, and that you, have, you and your team and the participants have the video conference login information, the link and password. We also got to confirm that the witnesses environment check is completing. You know, recalling what Howie said earlier about others in the room and any communication technology at hand being disclosed for the record. This is really important. All parties should be on camera during the deposition as if they were in the room. This makes it easier for the court reporter to identify each of the parties for the record and see who is speaking, but you will also want to see everyone just to make sure that everybody's behaving and following protocol 
in the remote deposition itself. And then at this point, the agency should do their final check as well. They should also make sure that everybody who, has, who was invited has signed on, and the technology check and environment check has been completed, and that they're there to answer any questions and remain available as well uh, on call to the court reporter as technical support, because we want the court reporter to be focused on taking down the deposition itself and not, ask, ask, uh, not be tech support. So the proceeding, during the proceeding, the proceeding has begun. And so what are some of the best practices and what should the court reporter be doing? So here are some best practices when it comes to remote audio and video. You know, if you aren't speaking, mute yourself. This will reduce background noise and feedback. If you're having issues with pulling the audio through the internet and you're having trouble hearing or being heard, connect to the audio with your phone. Call in. Also, make sure to turn the video on and keep it on that you can see the reporter and videographer and make sure that they can see you. Again, kind of reverting back to having the video on is very important so that the core reporter can take an accurate record. And also, if your laptop does not have a camera, invest in an HD camera. There are so many great options out there starting at $50 and you would be able to capture a great video. So what should you expect from the core reporter during the, the deposition? So, you will recognize all of these bullets since these items have always been their primary responsibility. The court reporter will continue to initiate the proceeding. They will start the record. They will request counsel to identify themselves and state who they represent on the record and for the record. They ask that all other persons identify themselves for the record, including anyone who might be in the room with the witness. They also add to the record anyone who joins in late. Most importantly, they swear in the witness with the option of confirming with counsel before swearing the witness in that the remote oath has the same effect and force as if done in person. And reading in any stipulations agreed upon in advance with the taking attorney. They also record the entry and exit of all parties unrelated to loss of connection. And they stop the proceeding if anyone drops their connection so that way no one misses any of the testimony. Most importantly, they do not handle exhibits. The entire focus of the court reporter should be on capturing the verbatim record. Our new at normal, this fully virtual environment that we are in does not lend itself to the court reporter handling exhibits. There is no way to slide the papers across the table as we used to. But however, the process of sharing and distributing documents to others at the proceeding is pretty simple and straightforward and can be done successful. So the council or the person so designated can use the platform share screen function to share new exhibits and also give a description of the document and its exhibit number. The required formats of the exhibits depend on the video conferencing software you're using, but most of the major brands will allow you to share any document you can view on your computer not just a PDF, but also an X-ray, um, an Excel spreadsheet, or a CAD drawing. However, for purposes of enabling others to view the files independently and including these exhibits in the finished document, PDFs are the preferred format for distribution. You should also be able to distribute copies of the exhibits to the other parties as if you were handing out paper copies. The way that you will do that will depend on the video conferencing platform that you use. So you have various different options. You can distribute by email. You can share screen in Zoom. 
you could do file transfers, you could do box uploads, and then also you can uh, utilize um, specialized software such as Agile Law or Edipose that give a bit more flexibility and options with sharing these exhibits to all parties. Mm. So, but let's remember that exhibits are not considered submitted to the core reporter until you actually send them to the reporter. And after the deposition, all exhibits that were either sent to the reporter ahead of time or shared during the proceeding should be sent immediately following the methodology agreed upon with the agency. And in regards to annotating, you have several different options when it comes to the annotation of exhibits. If you're displaying a PDF, you can use the Acrobat Common tools to highlight, circle, or mark up the document. The advantage of doing that is that first, you can do this ahead of time if it fits your approach. Secondly, you'll actually be marking up the document and not just a single page. You can also use some of the annotation tools that come with the video conferencing platform, and you can um, utilize that during the deposition itself. Become familiar with how the annotation tools work before the day of the deposition. Now, the deposition is over. What does everyone do next? So the core reporter confirms all orders and collects the witness's email address so that the witness can receive, review, and return the read and sign. The remote videographer, if there is one present and added to that job, will confirm orders and ask if the video should be synchronized to a transcript or unsynchronized. And let's keep in mind that the quality of the video now remote will depend on the quality of the witness's webcam, audio, and bandwidth. That's why it is important to think about these um, different items beforehand, before taking the deposition. And if you haven't already submitted this, the exhibits, we recommend renaming the file names to include the exhibit number, and then sending the files to the agency using the process that you've discussed beforehand. Make sure though that you understand the security the platform used to transfer, access, store, and distribute the final transcript exhibits and video. Because even though we're in a new abnormal, normal <laughs> remote world, the model rules of professional conduct still applies. You have a duty to protect your client's information from unauthorized access. So once the core reporter has access to a document, she or he will prepare them for the agency. Any questions about the exhibit should be between the core reporter and the firm contact. And finally, the core reporter will then um, transmit the final transcript to the agency. And after that, you will be notified as to the manner in which you can access these files. But finally, let's discuss security. So the technology that you use to hold depositions is very important, especially now. It is the simple slip-ups that can be exploited. Remote proceedings present unique data security issues. When you work with a court reporting agency, make sure that they are not just jumping on the Zoom train and, not, and pivoting to doing remote depositions because you can leave yourself open to slip-ups. And it's these security slip-ups that can damage you and your client. So ask your agency these questions. How familiar is the agency with the security controls of their video conference software? Is the meeting password protected, right? Can the one-to-one -one chat feature be turned off to prevent the witness from receiving assistance from another party? Can the video conferencing session be locked at the start of the proceeding, right? We've all heard about Zoom bombing. So these are key items to keep in mind in order to prevent that. What is the security used to protect the documents stored? And how are the exhibits sent to the, to the core reporter? Remember, 
it is still your responsibility to safeguard client information. And it's your duty to be competent in technology and understand how to use it. Handing it over to Hallie. Thank you so much, Karen. Well, we are going to wrap up the presentation today. We're right at the top of the hour. Um, and just to recap what we did go over, litigating remotely, what we are all adjusting to or dealing with on our daily day to day, understanding the rules governing remote depositions, and then remote services that are available for online proceedings and capturing the record accurately. Uh, preparing for your deposition before, during, and after, everything ranging from witness prep to your own personal environment prep um, and exhibits as well. And then keeping your information secure, um, whether it's you personally, whether it's your firm, it's vitally important now more than ever to make sure that the cybersecurity concerns are addressed as soon as possible. So I would like to say on behalf of Esquire and our wonderful host, Legal Fuel, thank you so very much for attending this webinar. Um, we will be following up with um, the CLE course code. And if there are any individual questions, please do not hesitate, whether now in the Q&A or via email, our contact information is available and Karen and myself are always available to take any calls or questions that you have. Um, please do uh, visit the Legal Field website. It's an excellent resource if you haven't checked it out already. And again, thank you so much, Jonathan, for all of your support and arranging this today. Thank you. We hope it was we hope it was a value to you. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. And as Hallie shared, if you're interested in any of the technology or platforms discussed today and want to have a hands-on demo, we are right here for you. Thank you again to Legal Fuel for this opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Hallie and Karen, and thank you to all of our attendees. As, as Hallie said, uh, we will be making this available to everybody on the LegalFuel.com website, and you will also be receiving an email with a link to the recording on our website as well. And just in case anybody still needs it, the CLE code for today was 4076. Thank you again, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan.